Well, good morning, Saints of Alstonville. It's um, fantastic to be back at my home church. Um, I like it when you greet me as a visitor, but I still do have a very strong sense that this is where I belong. Before we open God's Word and have a chat this morning, I would just invite you again to bow your heads in prayer. Father in heaven, we are so privileged to be here this morning to contemplate the grand themes of heaven. And as we consider the power of an idea this morning, Lord, my prayer is that your spirit would be here to help me to speak clearly and for the saints that they may listen. Lord, take us from some of the childish and juvenile ways that we may have been hanging on to in our thinking of you and instead clarify our eyesight and increase our ability to hear and understand is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a look at the yellow and the blue line, most people who have grown up in the West and have a ability to think and see spatially will agree that the yellow line looks slightly longer than the blue. Do you see that? That the yellow line looks slightly longer than the blue? If I were to remove the chevrons or arrows from each end and you look at those lines again, they look much closer to the same size, would you agree? And when we put the chevrons and arrows back, you're annoyed at yourself because you know that the lines are the same length, but your mind still plays a trick on you, encouraging you to see that the yellow line is slightly longer than the blue. For many, many years, people have studied this optical illusion and have tried to decide why it is that the yellow line appears longer than the blue. For a while, the theories went that those people who grew up in boxed houses learned to see the angled lines of a box perspective and reconcile it in their spatial areas of their brains. And so people who grew up in boxes see the top line as something that's further away, as if it was in the back corner of the room, whereas the blue line is closer to them and it's in the front of the room and therefore their, their minds take into um, fact, perspective or depth. Then somebody came up with an inciting discovery when they were exploring this idea that people who grew up in boxes see it differently than those who didn't, and they discovered that African tribes will see these lines as exactly the same length. And so they started to pull the eyes out of Africans and count the number of cells on their retinas, and they came up with a theory that there is a greater density of a particular type of cells in the retina of black people that help them reconcile this spatial inconsistency. Then somebody came along and for nothing better to do, decided to do their PhD to ridicule the idea that black people saw this and white people didn't. And they discovered that black people that lived in New York in boxes saw it exactly the same way as white people who lived in boxes in New York. And so they took a whole lot of white people and stranded them on a black island for a little while to see if they could see. No, I'm, I'm getting a bit carried away. If you look at this here, you will recognise that the pink line that is in the corner of the, d the two walls joining themselves looks longer than the pink line on the window. But for those of you who understand my skill in technology, all I have done is superimpose these two pictures and these two pink lines are the same in every one of these images. As soon as we surround those pink lines with a three-dimensional structure, our brains do something different and we want to see that those two lines are a different length. We want to reconcile what we know in 3D space tells us that there is variance between those lines. I would like to suggest that context has a lot to do with how we see things. Would you agree? That context has a lot to, to, to do with how we see things. When I look at that mock duck, I think of my wife. Now, other people might not be excited about mock duck, but for me, it's up there very close to being on the same shelf as the vegetarian sausages. I really like that product. Kimchi does nothing for me. Is there anyone here who likes kimchi? Yeah, kimchi does something for Anita, but for me, does nothing for me. Sauerkraut, I don't think I would ever choose it 
if I went to a restaurant. And yet Sophie down the front here is going, you stupid Anglos, if you just understood a little bit of European culture, you would recognise that taking a perfectly good cabbage, taking it up, putting it on your roof and waiting for it to get rotten enough so that maggots will swim in its juice, then bringing it down, putting it on the kitchen table and just relishing the fact that we can eat it. Amen. Context determines how we perceive truth. When we have a frame of reference, we see things differently. And what I would like to talk to you this morning about is the power of ideas. The power of ideas, and particularly the context in which they occur. When we see something with a new perspective, or in a new setting, or in new circumstances, sometimes we can be led to perceive it in a very different way. In 1962, Thomas Kuhn challenged the idea that science and the development of thought and knowledge progresses by small incremental steps. Instead, he suggests that more often than not, major scientific discoveries progress by revolution and not evolution. He came up with the idea that for most of us, we have working models that, that we attempt to use to clarify and describe the world around us. And when a working model is proposed, usually it's proposed because it's the model that accommodates all known data. And as new data is discovered and as, as um, knowledge is investigated and probed, the model is tested and for a while there can sometimes be a few little inconsistencies here and there that come up that would suggest that the model is not as robust as it could be. Normally within science, in the first few years of a model being proposed and accepted as the working model, there is a lot of um, resistance to change that working model. And we often will describe as an anomaly or an outlier or a methodological inconsistency, something that doesn't fit with the working model. But after a while, if knowledge is continued to be pursued and data explored and experiments done, there will come a tipping point where the model will be in crisis and people will begin to say, this just doesn't fit anymore. The classic story is the story of our understanding of how the Earth relates to the universe. Ptolemy, who was a BC philosopher and scholar, suggested that the Earth was the center of the universe. And if you looked into the night sky, you would see the sun and the moon starting in the east and rising and setting in the west. And with the Earth as the center of the universe, for thousands of years, people were very comfortable with a Ptolemaic model of the universe. Then someone like Copernicus came along, and he was so frightened of introducing his radical idea that perhaps the sun was the center of the solar system that he waited to his deathbed to publish his findings, knowing full well, like his um, successor Galileo, that sometimes even people who were supposed to be custodians of truth would persecute you if you came up with an idea that was different from the established norm. And when Galileo started to introduce the idea of elliptical orbits and, and a few other things with Kepler, there was a lot of resistance to accepting this new view of the universe. But the more maths they did and the more telescopes they built and the bigger uh, their capacity was to explore what was going on in the heavens, the more and more the Ptolemaic model fell away so that most people in this church today would be very comfortable with a Kepler-Copernican view of the universe. Would I be correct? But that progression in truth was not incremental. It happened when the current model failed to live up to its expectations of being robust enough to deal with new information. And so Thomas Kuhn describes this idea of a revolution in thought that leads to a paradigm shift, and the consequences of that paradigm shift is that we get a new working model. And then we start the cycle again. That new working model is robust, and for the first few years, people protect it. They, they would um, criticise anybody who would challenge it as doing poor science or having bad methodology or not having a repeatable experiment. And the orthodoxy will set in until that model reaches a crisis point and new information comes along, and it is at breaking point, and then there's a radical paradigm shift. And for those of you who 
want to drop apples and rocks from the Tower of Pisa, you will understand that we've gone through a, a phase of, of describing Newtonian physics and then we've moved on to the theory of relativity and then we've progressed from that to quantum theory. And knowledge is constantly having to accommodate new questions, new information, new data. How do we make sense of it all? I'm not here to, de to defend or criti critique the work of Thomas Kuhn, but I would think that most of you who were well-read or at least well-listened would have at least heard of the concept of paradigm shift, which Thomas Kuhn brought into our language. I would like to say that what I'm learning from studying the, the ideas of Kuhn and those who critique him is that it would be a reasonable proposition to suggest that there is always going to be tension in society between those who are seeking to protect orthodoxy and those who are seeking to innovate and bring on a better and newer idea. Would you agree? Even within the community of believers, there are those of us who are biased to wanting to protect what has been learned and those who would want to move forward to new truths. What history does teach us is that those who would wish to protect a bad idea will never have an army big enough or guns powerful enough or jails strong enough to overcome the power of an idea. The Catholic Church, which was the established church of its day, attempted to take Galileo and many of his colleagues and lock them up, put them under duress, threaten them with excommunication if they didn't toe the line of orthodoxy. And just in case those of you who are feeling like to, you can puff your chest out because we are heirs of the Protestant Reformation, Luther wasn't too kind to them, nor was Melanchthon, who was the original systematic theologian of the Protestant Reformation. It was an idea that threatened the comfort zone of its generation, and there will remain today within the um, church congregation those who still feel threatened by the idea that we need to see something clearer or there's a better way of saying it. What history has shown is that you can suppress truth, you can revile it, you can depreciate it, you can persecute it, but the power of true ideas will always win. Can anybody say amen? Truth will triumph. And the power of an idea will always trump the idea of power. It has often been said that it is those with the weakest arguments that shout the loudest. And history has shown us that there have always been those who are unwilling to listen or accept the challenge of new paradigms and new truth. You know, in a sense, Seventh-day Adventists are very comfortable with this discussion. We have at the core of our theological premise the idea that there is a great disagreement going on in the universe. There is a great controversy. There are, there are different ideas that have been put forward as a way of explaining the way that the universe works. And this war between ideas will one day be resolved. And isn't it great to know that the idea of power will never trump the power of an idea. We believe that God is love. We believe that his love leads his universe to worship him. But there was a counter-narrative that was introduced by the adversary of God. There was a new story that came along that said, no, God is not love. God is instead arbitrary. God is restricting your freedom. God is trying to... to, to um, keep you from experiencing all that can be experienced. And God is not worthy of your worship. We need to walk away from the, the paradigm and the worldview and the space that God has made for us. And we need to experience a new reality and a new experience. And our first parents, according to the Bible, bought into this idea. And they accepted the counter-narrative. And they came up with a new idea that they didn't need a God because they themselves were God. 
and shifting their focus from worship of a divine being who created and, and, and invested in them and loved them and provided them with everything they needed. In rebellion and in independence, our first fathers walked away from the worldview of God and established their own. There was a paradigm shift on this planet. And we have been living out the testing of that new paradigm. Death, pain and sin have been evident and those who have observed the consequences of accepting this new worldview have recognised that there is weakness in the model. When Jesus came and hung on the cross, when Jesus came and paid the penalty for sin's price, when Jesus was lifted up before the watching universe, people recognised that there were major flaws in the counter-narrative, and there was a triumphant recognition that love has won, love is winning, and love will win. And this universe will eventually reach the point where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that God's story is the story that makes the most sense. Can you say amen? Both sides of this counter-narrative, both sides of the argument, both sides of the story want to insist that the empirical, observable data best fits their view. Bible prophecy suggests that the side with the weakest argument will shout the loudest and that there will be efforts to use force and compulsion, to use blackmail, to use all sorts of harassment, to compel people to accept the narrative that is futile and that is failing. As Christians, we are living in a time in Kuhn's cycle of, um, I guess, paradigm shift where the model is in crisis and the sides lie undecided. And I believe it is our responsibility to hang on to the idea of God like we've never hung on before. To give witness that God's ideas can produce a better working model than the ideas of selfishness and independence. You know, I love reading, I love learning, I love knowledge. I would love to be physically healthy, I love to be financially secure, I love to have financial independence, I love the joy of living with choices. But when I read the Bible, I'm reminded that there is one thing and one thing above all that really ought to get us excited. Should we get excited about our wisdom? The Bible says no. Should we get excited about our wealth and our riches? The Bible says no. Should we get excited that we are powerful and strong? Absolutely not. What should we get excited about? What should be our claim to fame? We need to get excited when we have a clear understanding of who God is. You know, when we're looking at all those food products and those tin products, how sad it is that many people, when they see the product label God, associate it with a mean, nasty Christian who was, did horrible things to their dog or cat. Or they think of the experience they had at a, at a school where someone in a position of religious authority abused the privilege of that authority and created great hurt and pain. It is tragic as we opened our discussion today that the context that surrounds the idea can be so influential that we can say something is shorter or longer or, 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 or different than it really is because we are so impacted by the context with which that truth is framed. And don't you think that God has given us a great responsibility as Christians to make sure that we provide a context to the ideas of God that are attractive and that present them accurately. What I wanted to do today, very briefly, was to run through the Gospel of John and to show that in John's Gospel, Jesus has introduced us to some ideas that are powerful, that are life-changing, that we loosely put together and call the Gospel. Christians talk about being born again. Being born again is not so much about a physical transformation as it is about a transformation of ideas. Would you agree? It is about seeing God in a new way, a way that is powerful, a way that is effective, a way that is transformative. 
so transformative. When the Holy Spirit rescues us from our warped ideas of what God is like, then we are placed in a position that the gospel can have power in our life. In the Seventh-day Adventist Church, one of our pioneers, one of the, the, the key people that helped establish our church as a denomination, describes her own conversion experience. She was raised in a Methodist home, and if you know anything about the Puritans and the Methodists, they created a very high expectation of what holiness ought to look like. And for many years, Ellen White was convinced that there was a standard to which she could not measure up. And she had in her mind this picture of a God that would look down at Ellen and say, try harder, work harder, you're nearly there but you're not quite there yet. And one day feeling hopelessly lost, feeling like she could never measure up to the expectation of a holy God, a wise person in the Methodist church said, please go and talk to a godly elder. And as she spoke to that godly elder, that godly elder opened to her mind a new way of picturing God. And listen in Ellen's own words as she described what happened in her own conversion. She said, Faith took possession of my heart. I felt an inexpressible love of God and had the witness of his spirit that my sins were pardoned. My views of the Father changed. Did you get that? Conversion is when our ideas about who God is change. He is changed from being arbitrary and restrictive and vindictive and authoritarian to being nurturing and forgiving and redemptive and empowering. Ellen White's views of the Father were changed. She said, I now looked upon him as a kind and tender parent rather than a stern tyrant compelling men to blind obedience. My heart went out to him in a deep and fervent love. Obedience to his will seemed a joy. It was a pleasure to be in his service. Do you like that? Has that happened to you? Has it happened to me? I'm sure all of us can in some sense respond to those moments in our life where for the first time we see God in an attractive way and we go, wow, I just want to be in his presence. The Bible tells us that Jesus came to show us what God is like. This is life eternal, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one who you sent to the earth. Jesus came to show us what God was like. He came to clear away the myriad of misconceptions that over the centuries had become established orthodoxy. He challenged the foundational assumptions of those claiming to be custodians of truth. He collided with the established paradigms of his day and he could at the same time proclaim to those who were listening to his kingdom presentations that he was giving them something equally radical new as it was eternally true. God was not coming up with new ideas about what he was like. He was clarifying from the mess that humanity had made a true picture of God. Just like Jeremiah, whose words we read before, he was showing God to be a kind parent, someone whose service it was a joy to be in, somebody who was capable and able to take the most hopeless of sinners and give them the assurance that if they would hang on to Jesus' hand, he could forgive them of their sins and he could inspire them on a new pathway that would take them all the way to their eternal home. Jesus rejected the efforts and encouragements of those who tried to make him fit into their messianic picture. He rejected the pressure to be the kind of king they wanted him to be. He didn't look like a Messiah to most of them, and those who were most keen to find and worship the Messiah ended up nailing him to a tree because he didn't look like he fitted in with their ideas. Could it be when we look at Calvary that we have to change our assumption that the power of an idea will win over the idea of power? Jesus' life tells us that his kingdom principles planted like seeds in the good soil or yeast in the dough, they went on to do something amazing. And historians would agree that whether they 
concede that Jesus was God or not, that Jesus Christ changed history forever. I don't care what it is that is your field of interest, whether you're an economist, whether you're a politician, whether you're a sociologist, whether you just like gardening or all you want to do is make babies. But if you study the life of Jesus, you will find that there will be seeds and ideas and principles that he introduced that were revolutionary and that were true. Can you say amen? In every sphere of human experience, Jesus has left us a legacy of ideas that are redemptive, that are transformative, that are powerful, and that make sense. Jesus came to reveal what God is like to us. You know, for the Greeks and for every ancient civilization, the gods were distant. They existed in a realm that we could never approach, and they would say that the gods would never come from their realm to dwell or inhabit with us. But Jesus came down to our time and space. Jesus laid aside the essence of divinity, and he didn't come so much as to show us the manifestation of a physical God as much as to be the physical expression of the character of God. Jesus was called the Word. Jesus was, as it were, the idea of God in human flesh. Jesus came to give us a clear picture of what God is like. No wonder we're encouraged to spend a thoughtful hour every day contemplating the life of Christ. To know God is to love him. And our, uh, our life, our history, our story can so warp our perception of reality that sometimes we need the discipline of the clarification that comes from seeing truth in somebody other than ourselves. Jesus tells us that God loves us. He doesn't just love a special few. He loves the world. When Jesus said these famous words, he was addressing a Jewish leader whose worldview led him to see only an elite group as being worthy of salvation. Jesus came to explode the myths of exclusivity and parochial privilege. God's love is not restricted to the few. God loves the world. Often we are tempted to think that God's love is specifically designed for somebody better than me, holier than me, brighter than me, fitter than me, younger than me or older than me or different to me. But Jesus came to say, he laid the line in the sand. He said, I want you to recognize that God's love is for the world. It's for everybody, whoever, whenever, wherever, however, why ever, whoever believes in me can have eternal life. That's good news, wouldn't you say? This is fantastic news. This just shattered the established orthodoxy of Jewish belief. The Pharisees had books of laws. They had volume after volume after volume explaining in micro detail what it needed to look like in order to be considered a faithful, upright follower of Jesus. And Jesus came to explode these myths of exclusivity and said, whoever puts their confidence in me, they can be saved. Jesus spoke much about eternal life. He gave us a vision of the future. But the thing I love about Jesus is those little stories that tell us that Jesus is not just dealing with pie in the sky and some metaphysical realities that will come in the distant future. Jesus came to this earth to say to you and to I, don't be afraid, I am here. In the storm of your life, in the mess of your life, in the complicated story that is your own narrative, Jesus says, I am here. Don't be afraid. However boisterous the waves are, however powerful the wind, however noisy the thunder, however bright the lightning, I am here. I think that is amazing. I can testify in my own life, in my own experience, in my present story, there are mornings I wake up in a cold sweat wondering how I will ever manage to survive the day. And the thought that Jesus has said, don't be afraid, I am here, gives me the confidence to hang my helpless soul on him 
and say, Jesus, I'm not telling you what my story ought to look like, but I'm begging you not to let me go. We don't have the privilege of determining whether we will end up on one shore or the other, whether we will be in the boat or out of the boat. But if Jesus is close, we don't need to be afraid. Could you say amen? And for those of you who have never known the blessing of that kind of saviour, find somebody who has had a genuine Christian experience and they will tell you that God is faithful to his promise. We do not need to be afraid. We have a God who is here. Jesus said to the people, the truth that I'm telling you will set you free. You know, when I think of freedom, I'm kind of like Rob. I'd like a mansion. For me, I'd like to own my own Pacific Island. Anyone share that dream with me? I want a beach with white sand going all the way around my manor. I want to have 40 slaves. I never want to do a dish or mow another lawn in my life. I want to have my own private helicopter or a very fast speedboat, and when I get back to the mainland, I want to have a red Ferrari waiting for me on the dock so that when I drive to the grocery store to get my olives and vegetarian sausages, people will covet my experience and wish they were like me. Can anybody, or am I the only sinner? (laughs) The trouble is, friends, I've seen people who have that life. I've read about them in the new idea and all of those weekly magazines that my dental nurses leave strewn over the morning tea table. And sometimes you hear stories that people who have had the helicopters and the boats and the mansions and the private islands are in counselling or have substance abuse issues or are depressed. And I think to myself, what is it that really sets us free? What is it that really gives us the happiness that we are seeking? Could it be that Jesus' counter-narrative has value? Could it be that Jesus' radical idea, that it is the idea that we are loved and that we are valuable and that we are special and that we count, could overcome some of the securities and insecurities that we attempt to fill with houses and lands and cars and egos? Could it be that Jesus was on the money when he said, it is the truth that will make you free? In my own little journey, I have had the privilege of driving out of the showroom with a brand new car that smells delicious and has not on it one piece of roadkill. And it is great. It is fun. But I would have to say that there is no happiness that I have found in my own personal quest that can match the happiness that comes from the clarity of a good idea. Can you say amen? Maybe some of you have never had that joy. But I would rather be poor with a clear idea of God, who God is than have all of the treasures of the universe and have a warped perception of reality. It is that clarified idea of what God is like that inspires me to learn more and to study harder and to read more about Jesus. Why? Because we see through a glass darkly. Would you agree? However clear our perception is, it's not clear enough. Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, said, if any man thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. Throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity, even when sin is a far distant memory, there will still be new ideas about God to discover. Isn't that great? The joy of the redeemed will be to know him more because by knowing him more, we will love him more. And Jesus came along with his radical idea. He didn't attempt to revolutionise the political system. He didn't attempt to rescue the social injustice of his day. He didn't attempt to transform the inequality of society. Jesus came to get us a set of ideas that can set us free. Freedom is a state of mind and is not dependent on what we have or don't have. Truth is accessible by all willing to connect and learn from Jesus. It is only truth that can set us free and keep us free. Bad ideas are the greatest enemies to be feared, greater by far than poverty or want. Bad ideas are enemies to be feared more than the terrorist, the taxman or the taxidermist. It is bad ideas that are the enemies of happiness. 
Jesus came with the radical idea that those who thought they had it all together actually didn't. And I would like to make a proposition as we begin to close this morning and this afternoon's discussion that there really are only two kinds of people in this church today. There are those who are blind and there are those who know they are blind. Would you agree? Blind in the sense that there is so much more to learn. There is so much more to know. There is no greater enemy of freedom, truth and happiness than intellectual arrogance. To think that we know, that we have it all nailed down, that I've got five generations of preachers coursing through my veins and when they dissect me to see what I die of, they will have to go through vegetarian sausages to get there. Such ridiculous claims that somehow we are gifted or benefited from the legacy and the custodianship that we have been given can cripple this church. Would you agree? Crippled by efforts to protect an orthodoxy when God wants us to have a revolution and a paradigm shift. Our ultimate enemy is death. But Jesus tells us in the Gospel of John that he has beaten death. In John 11, his friends say, your best friend Lazarus is sick. And Jesus didn't rush to his friend Lazarus. He stayed where he was and the disciples were mystified. They wondered if he cared. And when Jesus finally arrives in Bethany, Lazarus has been wrapped up in bandages and hidden in a tomb and he has been there for four days. Mary and Martha, Lazarus' two sisters, come out to Jesus and they both say to him, Lord, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. And Jesus said, your brother will live again. Yes, Lord, I know he will live again at the end of time, at the resurrection of the just. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection. I am the life. If you believe in me, you will never die. Jesus goes to the tomb and he says, take away the stone. And he says, Lazarus, come forth. Jesus is not going to heal every person that dies, but Jesus wanted to, to, to lay down a benchmark. He wanted to show us that he had the power over death. He said, my friend Lazarus is asleep. Lord, he's dead. No, he's sleeping. This is not the end. This is not the finish. This is not the closing chapter of the story. This is only part of the introduction. If you put your faith and confidence and trust in me, I can beat death. If you believe in me, you can live. You know, with so many fantastic propositions that Jesus gave when he was here on this earth, you would think everybody would want to believe. And for a time they did. But truth is often expensive and truth is often inconvenient. Sometimes it cuts across the grain and we would rather protect the orthodoxy of foolishness than to embrace the expense of the truth. But Jesus said to his disciples, I am telling you things, I am giving you insights into my character and into your future and into the love of God for you so that in times of adversity and challenge you will not abandon your faith. It's interesting when you study the book of Revelation and you read the epistles of the apostles to the early church, they spent more time stressing, hanging on than anything else, of not allowing themselves to give up what they had learned. Jesus faced the most gruelling opposition when he walked this earth, and we will too. There are those who will be hostile to his counter-narrative. They will persecute and afflict and challenge and take on the ideas of God. We need to understand Jesus clearly as our water of life, as our bread of life, as our good shepherd, as the way, the truth and the life. We need to be connected to him as the vine. We need to trust in him as the only hope 
of our resurrection. There are so many more ideas that Jesus has for us. He said to his disciples, there's so much more I need to tell you. But the good news is, is that when Jesus has physically gone back to heaven, he has left behind another comforter to continue to inspire us, to continue to reveal what God is like, to continue to speak to us of Jesus. And ultimately, Jesus wants his church to be the communication of the idea of God to a world that so desperately needs to hear it. Just as Jesus has been sent into the world, so he is sending us. Wouldn't it be nice if from this church this afternoon, we sent forth 180 people committed to kindness, committed to love, committed to valuing the world, dispensing of any ideas of parochialism or exclusivity or elitism, seeing in every person they meet in the coming week a soul for whom Christ has died, somebody to be loved, to be cherished, to be nourished. It's a crazy mixed up world out there, would you agree? You can find just about any idea you want to cheer for on the internet. Those with power often aren't using it altruistically. They're often using it to protect their own interests and further their own cause. But as Christians, we need to recognise that the testimony of, of history, the testimony of scripture, the power of prophecy, all coalesce to give us a unified understanding that the idea of power will never beat the power of an idea. Love again will become the single uncontested paradigm of this universe. We will at some stage in human history recognise that it is futile to play and parley with sin. My proposition and those who have criticised Kuhn's paradigm shift theorem would say that there is an equal and opposite reality where a model that is right is only refined and reaffirmed by the test of new data and new experience. And won't it prove to be such in heaven? as we see the rewind of earth's history and as we see how God has dealt with humanity, as we appreciate his patience, his love, his mercy, his relentless pursuit of redeeming those that he created and ultimately wants to be with him. Every time we see God in action, we will again see that he is who he has claimed to be, a God of justice, a God of mercy, a God of power, a God of love, a God of relentless pursuit of you and of me. The worldview that has sin and egocentricity and independence at its core has shown to be futile. It is a spent theory. And in this time, I want to challenge you as I challenge me. Let us seek to recognise that our context, our history and our own stories have the power to compromise the purity of the idea of God. And knowing that and pleading with him for a clearer picture, a deeper understanding, the inevitable outcome is that we will know him more, love him more, and worship him more. Lord, you are above and you are beyond anything that we could imagine or even think. May we not be compelled to limit our views of what you are like because of our own story, our own experience. Give us the confidence to trust that you are exactly as Jesus has shown you to be, a father who would in no wise cast out any that would come to him a Father that can heal the most grievous and serious of ailments and illnesses, a Father who has grace for the thief, for the cheat, for the adulterer, for the murderer. 
Lord, whatever we have done, you have a solution. You are the answer to all of our questions. Give us the confidence and the trust and reward our faith. As we get to know you, Lord, may we love you and worship you, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.